Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Design and Implementation of Human Computer Interfaces, lecture number 28, where we will continue our discussion on black box testing. So, before we start, let us quickly recap what we learned and where we are now. So, as you may recollect, we are discussing the interactive system development life cycle. There are several stages in the life cycle. Among these stages, we have already covered some of the stages and we are currently focusing on a particular stage. So, we have already covered the requirement gathering stage, design prototype evaluate cycle as well as the code design stage, coding and implementation stage and currently we are discussing code testing that is once the system is implemented or the code is written for the system implementation, what we do for testing the efficacy of the code. There are broadly two ways using which we can design our testing process or there are broadly two ways using which we can test our code. One is review based and the other one is execution based. In review based code testing, again there are broadly two types, code walkthrough and code inspection. Primarily in review based code testing what we do? We basically ask the evaluators to go through the code and identify issues that they feel are present in the code. Here it is not mandatory to execute the code, although in the code walkthrough method some test cases may be provided for hand execution of the code. What we get as output of review based code testing is essentially qualitative issues that are there in the code which include conformation with the coding standards, conventions and presence of common errors, mostly these type of issues. The purpose of review based code testing is to identify as many issues as possible before we go for more rigorous and formal testing. It may be noted that more rigorous and formal code testing involves more effort than review based code testing. So, if we can clean the code as much as possible before we go for this uh, formal code testing, then our effort may be less. The effort required to test the code formally may be less. So, that is the objective of review based code testing to give us a quick review of issues that are present in the code. Once that is done, we go for execution based code testing. Of course, it is not mandatory to follow both the methods, any one is also fine as long as we have the ability to deal with the effort required. In execution based code testing, which is also the term used for referring to formal code testing, we generally use a set of test cases which is input output pair. For a given input, the output is mentioned and then we execute the code with the input to see whether the desired output is generated or not. If not, then there are issues and then we try to rectify those issues. In execution based code testing, there are broadly two ways of doing that. One is black box testing or functional testing, other one is white box testing or structural testing. Now, currently we are discussing black box testing, what it is? The basic idea is that here in this case, we try to design test cases based on only input output values rather than the design or the internal structure of the code. So, as we have mentioned in the previous lectures, it is very important when we go for formal code testing to design appropriate test cases. Now, randomly designed large number of test cases not necessarily reveal errors with the program. 
what we need is a more systematic approach to design suitable test cases. Now, there are broadly two ways to do that. One as we mentioned is a functional approach or also known as black box testing method and the other one is a structural approach which is also known as white box testing method. In functional approach what we do is basically we assume the code to be a collection of functions. Now, each function has its own input and it produces some output even if that is null but still that is a void output. When we are trying to test the code, that means when we are trying to design the suitable test cases, if we are bothered only about the input and output of a function rather than how the function actually processes the input to produce the output, that is the internal code of the function, then we are going to use black box testing method. That means we are looking at the functions as black boxes which takes only input and produces output without any knowledge of how the output is produced. In contrast, when we are actually trying to design test cases with the full knowledge of how the output is produced, that means we are aware of the internal structure of the code, then what we are following is called structural testing method or white box testing method. So, currently we are discussing black box testing method. In black box testing method, again there are two ways using which we can design the test cases. One is the equivalence class partitioning idea and the other one is boundary value analysis. We started our discussion on these two concepts, both are important when we are going for designing test cases. In case of equivalence class partitioning, what is the idea? We assume that the input domain is a very large set of values. It is so large that it is not possible to actually use each and every possible input for testing the program. So, what we do instead is we try to partition it into subsets. Each subset is called an equivalence class with the idea that the behavior of the program for any element of an equivalence class is same. That is suppose the class contains 20 elements or input values, for each value the program behaves in the same way. So, to test the program if we take any value rather than all 20 values then that would be sufficient to represent the entire class behavior. So, instead of 20 input values we can settle with one input value and the corresponding output value as a test case to test the behavior of the program for the entire equivalence class of inputs. That is the idea that means we are trying to manage the number of inputs to be considered for testing and we are trying to reduce the number to a manageable number. And why this works? Because we are already assuming that testing code with any one value of an equivalence class is as good as testing with all input values belonging to that class. So, this is very significant. So, we have to be very careful while we are partitioning the input domain into equivalence classes. If we do not do it properly, then definitely this assumption will not hold and our testing will be flawed. Let us try to understand this concept with some examples. We will see few examples where the idea of equivalence class, how to choose it and how to select equivalence classes so that our testing gives us as many errors as possible that happens. So, with few examples we will try to understand that. So, let us start with our first example. Suppose you have written a code to compute square root of an input integer in the range 0 to 5000 both inclusive. Now, you may think that is a very odd program why it should be restricted within this range. If I write a program that should be able to take any value as input and produce any output. Let us for the time being ignore those concerns and let us assume that this is what our code does for the sake of simplicity in 
discussion. So here the input is an integer within the specified range that is between 0 to 5000 and the output is the square root of that integer. Now if this is the given scenario, then what would be the equivalence classes? Let us start with defining only one equivalence class. So if this problem is given to you, then the most obvious answer would be to come up with an equivalence class with a single equivalence class which is set of all integers within the range 0 to 5000 both inclusive. So that is the most obvious answer that probably most of us will come up with when this problem is given to us. So what is our problem? Our problem is to identify the equivalence classes for the particular program to be tested. Now the program takes as input an integer within the range 0 to 5000 both inclusive and when we are asked to come up with the equivalence class partitioning for this particular problem, most of us most likely to come up with this answer that there will be only one class that is the set of all integers between this range 0 to 5000 both inclusive. Now of course is that the best thing to do? Will that give us what we are looking for that is a suitable test suit or the set of test cases that will be able to unearth all the problems that are there in the program? Can this single equivalence class give us that assurance? Let us see whether that is indeed the case. So what is the definition of equivalence class? It is a set of elements where for all elements in that particular set or the class, the program should behave in the same way. So if we are defining something as an equivalence class, then any element in that equivalence class when used as input should lead to the same behavior in the program. That means the program should be able to produce the same output. In other words, in an equivalence class we can choose any element to test our program. It is not necessary to choose all the elements, we can choose any one element because that is representative of all the elements that are present in the class. So then in our example, if we assume that there is single equivalence class which is the set of all integers within the range 0 to 5000, then what can be our test cases and test suit? Now our test cases should be in the form input and output as we have already seen earlier. So this is the doublet of the form input and output where the input is uh, any number taken from the equivalence class, a single number of course and output is the expected output of the program for the given input. So we are choosing a number as input and if that number is given to the program, it is supposed to produce some output. So the correct output that is supposed to be produced by the program is chosen as the output of the test case. Now in this example, if we have chosen a single equivalence class which is the set of all integers between the range 0 to 5000 both inclusive, then we can choose any one test case because all the other inputs will lead to the same program behavior, so no need to test for other inputs. So let us choose this one, 4, 2 where 4 is the input and 2 is the output that is 4 if given as input to the program produces the square root of 4 that is 2. 
Now, if we use only this single test case, so our test suit consists of a single test case, are we going to get a comprehensive idea of the program behavior? Here of course, we are assuming that we have a single equivalence class. That means by definition, we should be okay with a single test case. But does that really mean that with that single test case, we will be able to identify all issues that are there with the program? Ideally, it should be yes, we should be able to identify all issues that are present with the program because we have taken a representative case from the equivalence class. Now, here of course, the term representative is not very significant because any element from the equivalence class is a representative case. So, we do not need to do anything extra. But let us see one more example of an input. Suppose the user inputs minus 9. Is our program able to deal with this input in real usage scenario? Now, our program can produce output when the input is given within the range 0 to 5000. In real usage scenario, a user can make mistakes. The user can erroneously put minus 9. In that case, have we tested for that input with our test suit? Definitely no. So, we have not tested for this case, which may happen in real world scenario because users can make mistakes. We never tested for this input, it is outside the range we considered. So, what it implies? It implies that we missed something in our equivalence class formulation. It is not necessary that when we are thinking of equivalence class, we only think of situations where there will be no errors. 2R is human that we all know. So, while providing input, it is possible to make mistakes and we should be also careful about handling those scenarios where user input is not within the limit that is specified for correct behavior of the program. To take care of this scenario, let us redefine our equivalence class definition. Now, the class is defined as the set of all integers both positive and negative. Because we talked of minus 9, so obviously it may come to our mind that okay, then let us extend our definition, let us incorporate all integers, not only the integers within that specific range, but all integers whether negative or positive. So, this is another obvious extension of the definition of equivalence classes. Will it serve our purpose? With this extension of definition, will we be able to test program behavior for different scenarios? The answer is still no, we will not be able to test for different scenarios. Why? Let us see. With this new definition, again we take one test case. Let us say it is 9, 3. 9 is the input and 3 is the output that is square root of 9. Now, since the entire domain of integers is now considered to be the equivalence class, any one element here 9, it should be 9 rather than 4, any one element should be representative and sufficient to capture program behavior. The same thing that we have discussed earlier, that is now we have extended the definition of equivalence class, it encompasses all integers. However, for any integer within this class, the program should behave in the same way as per definition of equivalence class. So, if we choose any one integer from this class, which in this case is 9 as input, then the program behavior should be same for all other integers from this class. But is it really so? Clearly, that is not the case. 
it still cannot handle user inputs like minus 9. Remember that by definition we said that equivalence classes have elements that lead to same behavior for all inputs. However, this particular program that we are discussing are designed to deal with only inputs uh, from the range between 0 and 5000. Now, if we are considering minus 9 as an input, then of course, this program is not designed to take into account that input because it is outside the range. On the other hand, we have considered this as part of the equivalence class. So, clearly there is some issue with our definition of equivalence class considering the scope of the program. Also, we do not know what happens if user inputs 5001 onwards that is 5001, 5002 some integers that is greater than 5000 or outside the range that is defined for this program. So, with this definition of equivalence class where all integers are involved, we can choose any one integer as representative case, but that will not tell us anything about the program behavior when erroneous inputs are provided such as negative integers or integers that is outside the range namely 5001 onwards. So, you have to be very careful. We should not simply consider the most obvious range as the equivalence class. So, that is the biggest folly we generally make when we think of equivalence class as the most obvious range of values. It may affect our ability to form suitable test suit for comprehensive testing if we are unable to properly identify the equivalence classes. Now, let us go for a non-obvious solution for the same problem that is testing the code which produces square root for any integer within the range 0 to 5000. So, instead of 1, let us now consider 3 equivalence classes. First equivalence class that is set 1 which is set of all negative integers which represents invalid input range. So, from the point of view of the design of the program, any negative integer provided as input is an invalid input. So, we consider a separate equivalence class for all invalid inputs where inputs are negative integers. Then we have another set that is set 2 that is set of all integers in the range of 0 to 5000 both inclusive. Now, this represents the valid input range. And then we have another set that is set of all integers that are larger than 5000 which is another invalid input range. So, we have now 3 equivalence classes, one represents all negative integers, one represents all valid input that is integers within the range 0 to 5000 both inclusive and one represents all invalid positive integers that is integers which are greater than 5000. If we have these three sets as our equivalence classes, then what will be the test suit? Test suit must include representative input from all equivalence classes. That means, in this case there will be three test cases comprising of the test suite, one each for the three equivalence classes. Now, in the test case of course, along with the input we need to provide also the corresponding output to complete the doublet. For example, we can have a test suite like these three test cases comprising of these three test cases minus 5 with the corresponding output, 500 with the corresponding output, 6000 with the corresponding output. Now, in minus 5 that is an invalid input, in case of minus 5 which is an invalid input, the output can be a message, a message that invalid input. Similarly, when 6000 is provided as input, output can be a message like invalid input. 
whereas in case of 500 output can be the square root of 500. So, with this will our problem be solved? Now, before we go to that question let us just note these two things that is it is a set of 3 elements that means our test suit consists of 3 test cases. Each element or each test case is a representative of the corresponding equivalence set that is set 1, set 2 and set 3. Each element is of the form input and output. So, these things we should keep in mind while we are going to design our test suit. Now, if this is the scenario where we are forming 3 equivalence classes for the input domain and we are going for non-obvious classes then will it be able to handle all possible scenarios? Of course, in this case the answer is yes. We know what happens when the invalid inputs are provided and we know what happens when the valid inputs are provided. So, it gives a better partitioning than the earlier obvious partitioning schemes. So, thus with a more granular classes we could take care of different situations and once problems are identified we can accordingly modify the code to take care of those. Let us give one example of how to identify the issues and take care of those. So, when the test should suppose minus 5 and output is given where output is coming as null. So, probably this is not a very informative output. So, we may like to provide to the user a message mentioning invalid output rather than simply printing null. So, then there is some issue. So, maybe we need to rectify the corresponding code for dealing with invalid inputs and then there we need to print appropriate message. So, that is one way of taking care of issues while testing the code. Now, let us go for another example to better understand the concepts. Let us assume that you are asked to write a program which computes intersection point of 2 straight lines and displays the result and you are asked to test it. That means, you are asked to design suitable test cases or the test suit to test this program. What you are going to do? your job is to identify the equivalence classes and then correspondingly identify the test cases or the test suit. So, in this program we have as input two integer pairs m1 c1 and m2 c2. Each pair defines a straight line assuming the form y equal to mx plus c. So, m is the gradient and c is the intercept part. Now, the output is the intersection point of these two lines. If this is the problem that we are asked to design suitable test cases for this testing of this code, then what would be the equivalence classes? If we go by the obvious choice that is we can settle for set of all lines as representing the equivalence class. Will it work? It will not work. Why it will not work? For the same reason we will not be able to create a test suit to capture variations in input. That means, we will not be able to capture different execution scenarios for different inputs. So, what are those different scenarios? What are the variations that we are referring to here? Let us quickly have a look at those variations. Now, the input is pair of straight line. When we talk of variation, we should look to capture different relationships between the pair from the point of view of intersection. So, what can be the different relations between those input lines? There are 3 possibilities. There can be parallel lines that is m1 equal to m2 and c1 not equal to c2. We can have intersecting lines m1 not equal to m2 we can have coincident lines m1 equal to m2 c1 equal to c2. So, 
these three relationships can be there between the input pairs, between the input lines, parallel, intersecting or coincidental lines. So, if that is known, that is apparent to us, then what would be the equivalence classes? Clearly, to take care of these three different relationships, we need to have three equivalence classes, set of all parallel lines, set of all intersecting lines and set of all coincident lines. So, we have these three equivalence classes, one is set of all parallel lines, second one is set of all intersecting lines and third one is set of all coincidental lines. An example test suit is shown here. So, we have three elements each corresponding to one of the equivalence classes. In each element we have two pairs, this is line 1, this is line 2, this is M, this is C. So, for each element that is each line, it is represented with these two values gradient and intercept. Now, we can have these three elements corresponding to these three equivalence classes of set of all intersecting lines, set of all coincidental lines and set of all parallel lines. So, when we are talking of set of all parallel lines, we have m 1 equal to m 2, but c 1 not equal to c 2 and this input represents a representative element from the equivalence class. Of course, here we have not provided the output for simplicity in ideally here we should also provide the output. Then we have set of all intersecting lines m 1 not equal to m 2 and set of all parallel lines where set of all coincidental lines where we have m 1 equal to m 2 and c 1 equal to c 2. So, this is the input along with that we have to specify the output in each case. So, this is one equivalence class which this is one test suit based on the definition of the equivalence classes for this particular example which ideally should take care of the different scenarios. So, we will be able to know the program behavior for these three different scenarios. Now, let us quickly try to figure out this other problem. So, what would be the equivalence classes if instead of lines we now consider line segments. So, input is of the form x 1 1 y 1 1 x 2 1 y 2 1 and so on, where each pair indicate one end point and the output is intersection point or null. So, instead of uh, lines, we are now providing line segments as input and output is intersection point or null. Now, if that is the case, what would be the equivalence class or classes for testing this program? This is given as a take home exercise, you may try it whenever you get time. Let us now move to our third example. This is a slightly different example, earlier ones are mostly straightforward examples, but this one is more practical, more realistic example. Suppose you have developed an user authentication system which is part of a bigger system that you are working on. The authentication system or the function, let us consider this whole authentication system as nothing but a function. It takes as input user ID and produces success or failure messages which can be used to proceed further. For this given program that is the function which takes as input user ID and produces some message, if I want to test this program, what would be the equivalence class or classes? how do we design our test suit for this program. Now, here we know that input is user ID or user identifier, but that simple bit of information is not sufficient. 
we need more clarity on exactly what is the user identifier before we go for designing our test suit. So, first thing is you have to get more clarity on the input. Suppose a better clarified input is provided which is the user identifier is nothing but an alphanumeric string. Is it a sufficient information? Still not sufficient. For further clarity we probably require length information also. What is the length of the string? Is string of any length acceptable or the string must have a length restriction? Suppose it is further specified that the length of the string is restricted to 5 and exactly 5 that is user id must be a 5 character string. It cannot be a 4 character string, it cannot be a 6 character string or any number other than 5. So, that is a very clear way of specifying the input that is the program takes as input a 5 character alphanumeric string as user identifier and produces a message of success or failure while authenticating the user. Now, with that knowledge let us try to go for design of the test suit. So, the obvious or intuitive solution for equivalence classes would be set of all alphanumeric strings, but is it sufficient? Is it capable of identifying all issues with the program? Of course, not. Program behavior for a 10 character string and 5 character string should not be the same because we have specified that it should only accept 5 character string, it should not accept 10 character string. So, definitely the output that means the behavior of the program for these two different string lengths should be different. What can be a better solution? Let us have two equivalence classes, set of all alphanumeric strings of length 5 and equivalence class 2 is all other strings. Will it work? It looks like it should work, but will it really work? It may not work. Let us have an even better solution. So, we have class 1 which is that is equivalence class 1 which is set of all 5 character alphabetic only strings, equivalence class 2 set of all 5 character numeric only strings, class 3 set of all 5 character alphanumeric strings, class 4 set of all alphanumeric strings with length greater than 5, class 5 set of all alphanumeric strings with length less than 5, class 6 set of all strings with special characters that is characters other than alphanumeric characters. So, if we have these 6 sets, will it give us some better way of designing our test suits? Definitely yes. If we have only two equivalence classes, one is set of all 5 character alphanumeric strings and set of all strings that are not of 5 character length, that will not give us many scenarios as listed here. We will have our test suit comprising of only two cases which will not be sufficient to deal with these many scenarios that are listed in this improved solution. That means, what happens when we are inputting string with only numeric characters, string with only alphabetic characters, string with alphanumeric characters, string with special characters although it may be of 5 character length, strings of length more than 5 or less than 5. So, all these different situations cannot be dealt with with only two equivalence classes. Instead, we have to go for more granular classes what is shown here. So, in this case what will be our test suit? One input output pair from each set. So, that means at least 6 test cases we can have which will give us a better idea of the performance of our program in different input scenario in comparison with the test suit that we would have got had we been considering 
the two equivalence classes as mentioned earlier. Can we do any better than these six classes? In fact, these six classes are still limited. There are other scenarios that are possible which will not be taken care of with these six classes. So, you can think of a better solution. I am leaving it as a take home exercise like the earlier one where we are considering line segments instead of lines. So, that is all about understanding the concept of equivalence class partitioning. I hope you got the idea that is when we are going for equivalence class partitioning, we should be very careful. What is not so obvious can give us much better solution. So, we should not always look for obvious solutions, we should think hard, think deeply to come up with suitable equivalence classes. The three examples are meant to give you an idea of how to think about suitably partitioning the input domain into appropriate equivalence classes. The other crucial component in designing our test suit while dealing with black box testing method is consideration of the boundary values or rather it is known as boundary value analysis. Programming errors frequently occurs at the boundaries of equivalence classes. So, equivalence classes are sets typically range of values at the boundaries of this range we often ignore those boundaries and at the boundaries of this range it is possible to encounter some error in the program. Now, when we say that once uh, an equivalence class is defined only one element from the class is good enough to test for all the values in that equivalence class, we are ignoring this fact that at the boundaries program behavior may change and we should also think carefully about our test cases when the boundaries are involved. So, due to oversight programmers often fail to notice special processing required for inputs at class boundaries. For example, while defining equivalence classes to define the set we may improperly use less than instead of less than equal to or conversely less than equal to instead of less than. So, there may be oversight of defining this class boundaries and because of that oversight we often ignore some input values that may lead to different behavior. So, in order to address this issue this boundary value analysis is also important while designing the test suits for black box testing. It essentially refers to selection of test cases at the boundaries of the equivalence classes it is as simple as that. For example, let us reconsider the earlier function to compute square root of integer values in the range of 0 to 5000. That is the first example that we have seen. Now, earlier we have seen that there are three equivalence classes that we can define to take care of different scenarios. Accordingly, we can have three test cases comprising our test suit. So, what are the three test cases? One test case each for each of these equivalence classes that is set of negative integers, set of integers in the range of 0 to 5000 and integers larger than 5000. These are the three equivalence classes that we have defined and for each of these three classes we can choose one input output pair resulting in three test cases or a test suit comprising of three elements for testing our code. Now, along with those three test cases we also should take into account the boundaries of these equivalence classes. So, one boundary is the value minus 1 that is the boundary for negative integer. For that boundary what should be the output? We should take care of this one can be 0 that is one of the boundary for valid inputs one of the boundaries for valid input and the corresponding output should be there. 5000 is the other boundary for valid inputs and the corresponding output should be there. 5001 is 
another boundary for invalid input and the corresponding output should be there. So, these are the boundary cases for the three equivalence classes which we should consider that means our test suit should have three class this five this four boundary cases that means total seven test cases. So, only choosing test cases based on equivalence classes may lead to some problem if we ignore the boundaries because while defining the equivalence classes we may have one definition, but that definition may be, be due to some oversight and some improper usage of notations may lead to some confusion on interpreting the classes. Accordingly, some values we may miss which may lead to different program behavior. So, it is always preferable to be extra careful while defining the equivalence classes and include the boundary cases in the test suit. So, keep in mind to include boundary cases along with the equivalence classes while designing the test suits. So, with that I hope you got some idea about the concepts that we are discussing namely equivalence classes and boundary values and why those are important few things we should note here. One is equivalence classes are sets that means while trying to express those classes we should ideally use set notations. When you are defining test cases it should contain both input as well as the expected output. So, only one is not sufficient you must have this input output pair and as a rule of thumb always keep in mind that you have to include test cases from valid classes, invalid classes and boundary cases in the black box test suits. Of course, you should not consider this statement to be indicating that there will be only two equivalence classes valid and invalid. Valid classes can further be divided partitioned as we have seen in our uh, earlier examples. Similarly, invalid classes can also be further divided into multiple equivalence classes. So, you should keep in mind that while designing equivalence classes you should consider valid cases or valid inputs, invalid inputs and also while designing test suits you should consider boundary values for the equivalence classes. In the next lecture we will go through one case study on how to create this testing document. So, as I said in this interactive system development life cycle at the end of each stage we produce some documentation. Earlier documents we have seen after the code testing we also produce some documentation. So, after review based code testing as we have seen we produce a document after black box testing we can equally we can similarly produce one document. In the next lecture we will see how that document looks, how it can be created in one case study. So, that is all for this lecture I hope you understood the concepts. The last few things that we mentioned should be kept in mind that is equivalence classes are sets. So, you must use you must use set notations to represent them while creating the documents and there are three things you should keep in mind while going for equivalence classes that is think of valid inputs, think of invalid inputs and think of boundary cases. And while specifying the test suit you must include both input as well as output not only input which is a common mistake that we often make. Whatever we are discussing can be found in these two books, Fundamentals of Software Engineering and Software Engineering a Practitioner's Approach. You can look at chapter 10 in the first book and chapters 19 to 21 in the second book to know more about software testing. In more details, 
I hope you enjoyed the content and understood the concepts. Looking forward to meet you all in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.